Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, if you're joining us on Zoom, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen. Wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a little Q&A button. Click on that, type in your question, and I'll get to those at the end. If you're watching on YouTube, just use the live chat function wherever it is on the device you're using, and I'll get to those at the end as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last 25 years or so. Oh, no, not 25, 10 years or so. Goodness, goodness. 10 years or so traveling around North America helping tech and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on, so I had about 30 franchisees I work with, as well as the shops that they service in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. And before that, it was eight years at Subaru, so I worked in the dealership and over time became the diagnostic guy in the shops. I always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher cars that would come into my bank. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous French and jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. Our topic today is maintenance functions. So as we're working on vehicles, you, know, you, you might think, well, I don't need a scan tool for, for changing the oil. Well, you, you, you do. And I'm, I'm sure at this point, if you've been working on any cars for any period of time, the shortest amount of time, uh, you understand that you need a scan tool to do just maintenance on a vehicle, oil changes, tire lights, batteries, uh, some other things that we might get into that you might not be so familiar with that you might need. Um, so, you know, things like, like I said, oil minder resets, parking brake, putting that into the service mode so you can change the pads, uh, battery resets, TPMS resets on diesels. You have the diesel particulate filter, so you have to do a regen on those sometimes. Uh, so there's a lot of different functions that you might not even be aware of that you may need to use your scan tool for. Really, it's just pretty much any car out there nowadays needs a scan tool for something, right? So uh, this is just one of those many things. And it's the most one of the more common things, too, is oil changes, tire rotations, stuff like that. So let's talk first about oil changes and not just about using my scan tool to reset it, but I also need information in order to properly change oil now. Um, so back in a 2013 Chevy with a 5.3 liter engine, very, very common. Uh, back then it took uh, 5W30 oil and it took six quarts of that oil, right? But then one year later, 2014, uh, it took eight and a half quarts of 0W20. So they changed it from just one model year to the next. And you might just think, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's a 5.3 liter. Must only take six quarts of oil because I've been changing oil on a 5.3 liter forever. And that's just not the case, right? You need to have that accurate up-to-date information. If you just rely on that book lying on the wall, that might not be 100% what you need either because another thing happens. In that 2014, they actually revised that from eight and a half quarts down to eight quarts using a bulletin. So if you didn't know that and you didn't have the most up-to-date current information, you'd be putting too much oil in the truck. So if you were putting six quarts in, that's not enough. If you're following what it said in the book that would have been published, uh, would have been eight and a half quarts. And then depending on when they figured this out and published this bulletin and rolled it back to eight quarts, you might not have known that either. Uh, so, for example, here it is on the 13 Chevy Silverado, right? 5.3 engine with filter, six quarts of oil, 5W30, right? Easy enough. And it says use only engine oil licensed to the Deox Dex OS 1 specification or equivalent. AC Delco synthetic blend is recommended, et cetera. But if I go to a 14 Chevy 1500, uh, we'll see down here 5.3 engine, eight quarts. Up here is the 4.3 engine, six quarts still. 5.3 engine with filter, eight quarts, adds 0W20. And then we said, uh, <clears throat> note, the engine oil capacity has been updated from eight and a half quarts to eight quarts in reference to GM's document this. So if you didn't know that and you didn't have that current information, uh, you might be putting the wrong amount of oil in. 
Now, of course, you could get this from you know many different places. We get this from uh, from uh, Shopkey, of course. So Shopkey Mitchell. Uh, if you have a scan tool, a Snap-on scan tool with current software and an internet connection, you should have the quick lookups function on there as well, which would give you your fluid capacities, also your tire specs. So um, also in here, in this information, not just fluid capacities, but if I move over one tab, I have my reset procedure. And that brings us to, you know, what we're talking about here is what do I need to do to reset the oil miner? So you can do it with the uh, driver information center. You can just go in and it'll just reset it to whatever the default is. Um, you can also do a uh, uh, gas pedal within five seconds if you need to do that. Uh, it gives you a couple ways to do it that way, but also on the tool, if we go into functional reset, it's gonna bring me into my service interval reset, which we can change differently than just resetting it to 100%. So it says the value be set to 100%. Value can then be scrolled in 2% increments if value other than 100% is desired. Now you might be thinking, why in the world would I want less than 100% when I'm resetting it? So let's see, I, I, I got a really good example from a franchisee a couple months ago. I uh, just want something that he saw out there. So he said, well, let's say you got an 8,000 mile oil change interval, right? Which most vehicles nowadays, they got a long interval. Uh, some vehicles, you can actually go in and change what that interval is. Uh, but in this example, in Chevy, it's a percentage. So if I wanted to do it in, say, a 4,000 mile interval instead of an 8,000 mile interval, uh, the truck knows that 8,000 is 100%. So if I wanted to bring it down to 4,000, I'd just dial that back using the minus button, bring it down to 50%. And then it would take 50% of the time to get there because it's half the time. So that's just one example where you might be able to use that. Now, there's tons of other, every manufacturer is a little bit different. So having this at your fingertips right on the tool is very helpful. Uh, you can also, like I said, you can look it up in information too, but if I don't have to leave the hood of the car, don't have to leave the bay, now even easier. How about tires? Also in there, inside that uh, quick lookups, there's tire pressure uh, reset reminder. So there's a reset procedure for that. Uh, when a low tire pressure condition is detected, TPMS illuminates a low tire warning light in the instrument cluster. I should check the pressure uh, goes in the driver uh, in specific tire displays in the driver information center. Now that's important too. Remember that the specific tire. So if I do a tire rotation on the vehicle, I need to make sure I relearn those tires. Even if I didn't have a low tire light, uh, every time you do a rotation and a balance on a vehicle with TPMS, which is a lot of them now, because that's since what, 06 or so. Um, so um, low tire pressure warning line and the driver information center message come on in each ignition cycle until the tires are inflated, correct inflation pressure. Each TPMS sensor has a unique identification code. The identification code needs to be matched to the new tire and wheel position after rotating the vehicle's tires or replacing one or more of the sensors. So that says it right there. If I ever do a rotation or whatever, I have to do this. TPMS sensor matching process should also be performed after replacing a spare tire with a road tire containing the TPMS sensor. Malfunction light of the driver information center message should go off the next ignition cycle. All right, so it's going to tell you how to do this. Uh, you can use your five-way code. Press and hold the button on the five-way driver information center control. The horn sounds twice. The signal receiver is in learn mode. And the tire learning active message display on the driver information center screen. Start with the driver's side front. Any vehicle, when you're doing TPMS, you want to start with the driver's side front. Uh, and then you're going to go around the vehicle clockwise. So once it's in a learning mode, it's going to go, and you need the activation tool, which we're going to talk more about in a little bit. Near the valve stem, press the button to activate. Horn trip confirms that the sensor has been stored. And then you just go around in the next one. So you just repeat for all four tires and the spare. Uh, on vehicles with dualies, it will tell you to do inner and outer tires as well. So just so you know, if you do have a dually, uh, you do need to do all the tires. Uh, here's a different one you can do using the iDrive system on a BMW, right? So you can go in there and actually do it within the vehicle. Uh, in the uh, iDrive, the My Vehicle Vehicle Status Tire Pressure Monitor and hit Perform Reset and then Drive. So that just drives it. So in this case, you wouldn't need a scan tool, but the information's there. And then also for an example, a 2018 Ram 1500, they don't publish any information. Uh, 
So in this case, we can go into the functional reset, which is also behind security, just so you know. Uh, and then it's going to do individual sensor ID. So front left, right front, left rear, right rear, and the spare tire are in there as well on this ramp. Uh, should be used to write the left front tires, which is the one I chose. There's the ID. So in this case, you have to have the eight character sensor ID available. It can be found on the tire sensor label itself. If I'm replacing it, I can do it that way. Or if I use a TPMS sensor tool, I may be able to extract it off of that as well. Uh, so you go in here, you click edit, type in the ID, and it just says verify your ID numbers that you want to program, hit continue, and then it'll say it's done or it'll say it didn't work. But in this case, it was successful. Another example where you might get tripped up is Nissan has some interesting ways to do this too. Now, there's two different ways to do it on a Nissan. Uh, if we go into functional reset, it's going to give us the option to use uh, with the registration tool or without the registration tool. So this J45295 tool, that's going to be something like TPMS3, TPMS4, TPMS5, uh, any of Snap-on's activation tools, plus there's others out there too. Uh, but an example, you see the antenna right there and you see the little antenna button right there. So all you do is hold that right next to the the sensor, not on the metal part of the wheel, on the rubber part, uh, on the tire. And then that'll activate the sensor and do it that way. So there's two different ways to do it. Uh, it's used to register tire pressure transmitter IDs without the use of the tool. Uh, if I don't use the tool, uh, it'll only work with existing sensors. If a new sensor is installed, you have to use this tool. So you can do it either way. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna tell you to adjust the tire pressures accordingly. So if I see left front at 34, right front at 31, right rear at 29, left rear at 26, notice how it's different and notice how it's you know three, four PSI different. As you drive down the road, um, the computer will see, okay, well, the, I see a tire at 34 PSI. So that must be the left front and that's the one that registers for the left front, et cetera. Uh, so key on engine off, select continue, start the test, and it'll start flashing, and then drive the vehicle five to 15 minutes until it says test completed. Vehicle must be driven, and the TPMS light will go out. Fails to complete, exit the test and try again, following the instructions in detail. They have to be specific pressures, as I said in that one. Or you can just use the tool and just zap the wheels and, and you're done. Next up, battery functions, right? So if I replace a battery or do some sort of work to the electrical system, I may need to use that as well. Because most manufacturers use some type of a battery management system. They do different things, use different sensors, controllers, software, uh, monitors the battery state of health, state of charge. So that allows the vehicle to charge the battery depending on the load and the state of health. So if I have a brand new battery in there, it's going to charge at a different rate than a battery that's three, four, five years old. So most modern vehicles now, they'll compensate with the alternator uh, going up and down on the voltage in order to charge it however it needs to be charged. However, when you replace a battery, if you're putting a brand spanking new battery in there, it's going to charge at a much different rate, right? So I need to uh, reset the module, reset the system, reset the software. Um, Usually, you need to use a scan tool to do that. There's an example on a 16 Audi S5. So there's a coding and configuration function, and there's also a battery parameterization function. So if I go into coding, I can read the current code, go into the configuration, and program a new code. So if I wanted to program a new code, write down the current code before you program it. That'll allow you to re-enter it if you need to, if you mess up and you need to change it, or for some reason you don't change the battery. Uh, just make sure you write it down. And it's pretty long code too. So I might maybe snapshot that, screenshot that just in case. Uh, then you would go in there and edit. And then, uh, you know, that'll complete it. You hit edit, you type in whatever the code is, and then you hit complete and it programs it. The battery parameterization. Uh, in this test, it'll do the parameterization of the battery regulation. And then you'll tell the car, okay, so here's the amp hour rating of the battery, battery uh, top three of the serial number on the battery, and then the last 10 of the serial number on the battery. There you can edit all those in. That, of course, would be for factory batteries, I would suppose. 
uh, and then you just say program. All right, a couple different th ways we can do that, a couple different things that we need to do depending on the battery and the vehicle. And then we have brakes, of course, just changing pads, hanging pads on, on a vehicle. And you, just, <laughs> you need to use a, uh, a scan tool for that. All right, so we have a 2015 Kia. And one easy way to do it, if you have uh, one of the intelligent diagnostic tools with current software subscription on it or uh, the Veris Edge with current software on it, you'll have this quick service resets and relearns menu. In this case, we have 55 different things on this car we can do. So the nice thing about the service resets is it's not, all these resets are in the tool anyways. Uh, functional tests, output control, special functions, whatever they happen to be, they're already in the tool uh, available for you. You just might have to search through different, uh, different functions in order to find it or, or different modules in order to find it. In this case, it sorts them out by jobs. You could just pop in there and say, hey, did I replace an EVAP purge solenoid? What might I need to do for that? What did I replace the spark plugs? What might I, what might I need to do for that? Uh, so in this case, we want to replace the disc brake pads. You'll notice all the maintenance stuff is going to be sorted at the top. So replace brake rotor, spark plugs, wheel alignment, whatever. So replace disc brake pads. And then at the top, we'll get top repairs information. We also have a link to ShopKey if you have ShopKey, any TSBs that are available for it, and then functional resets and calibrations. When it opens that, what it's going to do is it's going to give us not just the functional test, but it also gives us maybe any other things we might need, like actuator release, inline release, uh, what have you. Uh, so any functional tests I might need. But in this case, we'll do pad change mode. There's before change and after change. So if I need to put it in that mode, click on that. Before changing the brake pads, this function should be performed. This will allow you to push the piston into the caliper by retracting the spindle nut with the actuator. Execute this before pad change mode, change the pads, and then execute pad change mode after pad change. While pad change mode is in progress, you'll see DTC 2750, and a test message is displayed at the cluster. So you'll continue. <coughs> so engine off, ignition on, correctly operating electronic parking brake, CLU, IPM, EMS, ESC, and TCU. Release the parking brake by pressing down the brake pedal and the parking brake switch while ignition is on. Once you do that, you go in, change your brakes, change your pads, and then you would come in back in here and go to after change. So it engages the electronic parking brake after the brake pads are replaced. <clears throat> do not use this function while the brake pads are being replaced. Please be sure to take general safety precautions for activating this function. Yes, yeah, so you don't want to be in the middle of replacing the pads, and then it goes back into parking brake mode and you know, maybe blow the piston out or something like that. We don't want to continue <clears throat> and it tells us the conditions again keep stepping on the brake until the motor stops and the whole process is finished so what you're going to do is you're going to activate it put the pads to the rotor with the you know with the piston and then it's going to put the actuator out to its full range of travel hit okay when you're done and you're done right? so you got to do that on a lot of vehicles nowadays for example like when i worked at subaru you know the early version of electronic parking brake it was drum Right. So you didn't necessarily have to do anything to do a pad change because it was disc pads uh, for the brakes. And then you had the drum was the parking brake internal into that. And then they changed that in about 14, where it was the caliper is your parking brake actuator. So then you had to add that function in there. So, uh, next one's diesel. Right, It's a lot of diesels out there, diesel trucks, even diesel cars. Uh, less so over here, but I know over in Europe for sure, tons of diesel cars over there. And I don't know, last 10, 15 years or so, at least, uh, they've been uh, mandating to treat soot coming out of the diesels. You know, diesels used to be very dirty. Uh, so they run a lot cleaner now, but they also have after treatment in order to do that. So oxidation catalyst, diesel particulate filter, which we're going to uh, be specific about now, exhaust temp sensors, DPF back pressure sensors, hydrocarbon dosing valves, and more. The main function or the, the diesel particulate filter has a couple different functions. So it's gonna store the particulates, right? So all the bad stuff comes in, it stores it. Once it gets full, it's going to need to burn it all off. Now in my mind, we think about this. It's capturing all this soot coming out so it doesn't go out the tailpipe. 
That's all well and good. But where's it going to go when I do a DPF reject? It's just going to go back up the tailpipe again. And actually in a more, you know, kind of more concentrated because you're doing it all at once. So instead of these emissions that would be going out you know, over time, or instead catching it and just making a massive fire basically inside there uh, to do that. So I don't know. It's just it's, it's how the industry is. So we got to do what we're asked to do. But it just to me, it just doesn't make sense to me. It just do doesn't make logical sense. But as they say, it's above my pay grade, I guess. But anyways, uh, so the diesel particular filter is like a, this honeycomb, right? So you see how it's in every other uh, block. So it goes, the bad stuff goes in the open block and then it uses that to filter it out, right? So it, it's gonna, the good stuff goes out this, the back of this block and then the bad stuff comes in this block. So they're like alternating blocked off top and bottom or front and back. So it captures all that stuff. And then over time, you're gonna get soot in there. Now, if you don't do a regen, um, it can end up looking like that, and then you may, may need to replace it or um, recore it. Those are our companies out there that'll do a recore on. But we don't want to get get it this far, right? So you, there's a few different ways you can initiate that. There's passive regen. Uh, that's when it's high enough uh, just to burn it off on its own without needing any extra fuel. It's going to be under high load situations. It's just going to kind of burn it off by itself. Active regen can be initiated by the PCM or by a scan tool. You're going to tell it, I want to regen. Extra fuel is then added to the exhaust to raise the EPF temperatures to approximately 1,025 degrees. Or we can do a parked regen initiated by the dashboard switch, or we can also do a regen uh, initiated by the scan tool as well. It's going to be used when the temps at active regens fail. So uh, certain vehicles... It'll try and do it on its own. It'll do it just driving down the road. After a while, it may get bad enough where the flow is reduced. So then it goes into like a D rate where it uh, doesn't have as much power or the speed might be limited. If it gets even worse, it can go to another stage. And I think it was like, a, I'm thinking about Chevy. Uh, they'll do it down to like where it can't go over like five, 10 miles an hour. And at that point, probably want to get towed or you know, whatever. Uh, and then it might not be able to be fixed with a, with a regen. Now, one thing you do need to remember about if you're going to do a regen on a diesel is clear the area around because it gets very, very hot. Lots of soot, lots of smoke, lots of flames <laughs> sometimes uh, coming out the back. Uh, so uh, with the scan tool, can't initiate that. Like I said, and that could, would be a maintenance function, um, just kind of clearing it out, cleaning it out how it needs to. So let's take a look at a couple other things as we go here. Uh, so let me pull up my first car here, Ford Focus. Oh, this is another maintenance thing that I, till I started doing research for this, I never really thought about it being a thing. But it is most definitely a thing. Uh, let me go in here. So 2016 Ford Focus, right? So that's a fairly common vehicle. Plenty of them on the road. But what they did in the early 20 teens at Ford, and I suppose they probably did it other places too, but the wiper motor on this vehicle, it is, they are not like your normal wiper motors. Right? So if I go into, say, remove and replace, and I want to look. It looks like a regular wiper motor, except now we don't have linkages. So they are there are two motors on these vehicles now. So there's you know one on the left, one on the right, and then there's no linkage in between. So they're just really just motors that they just go back and forth like a rotary motor, back and forth motors. So there's how to change it. If we go all the way down uh at the bottom after installation it says carry out the windshield wiper motor initialization so i can click on that and you will see uh turn them on and off using a diagnostic scan tool press the windshield wiper motors in learning mode using the calibration press the wiper and washer level up, down three times to start so it'll tell us how to do this and then what we need to do is we need to bring it so it's within 50 millimeters of either side of the windshield. So we have to, it's gonna put them in a position, we have to manually move them 
into their ending position, which is at the edge of the of the uh, windshield there. So that I just thought that was kind of interesting that that's a thing that even needs to be done. But if we go into scanner, and in this case, that is under the body control module. And we'll see we have a wiper motor module calibration. So it places the wiper motor module in calibration mode, perform this procedure with the wiper, arms have been removed and reinstalled. That's it. That's when you need to do it. Not the wipers themselves, but if the arms have been removed and reinstalled for any reason. So I replaced the windshield, definitely need to do it then. Um, sometimes I, I know, you know taking the cowl off sometimes to chase wires, to get to certain things that I needed to get to. Sometimes you got to take that cowl off, which means you got to take the wiper arms off. You know, it happens. Uh, so anytime you move those wiper arms, you need to do this calibration. So uh, we'll continue. Please make sure the following operations are complete. Windshield wipers have been installed correctly according to manufacturer specs. Battery has sufficient charge. A low battery voltage may prevent it from entering calibration mode and the windshield needs to be clean and dry. Make sure the ignition's on and the engine's not running. And then press the wiper washer switch down three times within five seconds. The wipers will swipe upwards to a pre-initialization position and stop. Gently pull both wipers out towards the A-pillar molding until the distance between the wiper arm where the wiper blade is mounted and the edge of the windshield is 50 millimeters. Press the wipe, wiper washer switch down one time. That'll set the current position as the approved position and the wiper arms will move back to the park position. The wiper arms are pulled closer to the A-pillar than the specified distance during the step. Do not attempt to move the wiper arms back towards the pre-initialization position manually. This is attempted. The wiper motor could be damaged. Pre-initialization can be reset by first selecting the intermittent on the wiper washer switch and then selecting them. So we're going to put them up in the their position. And then when it's done, we hit complete. And then it uh, says complete, procedures complete. Wiper motor modules in normal mode. Carry out low speed and high speed wiper tests. So even for the windshield wiper arms. And then we see other things in here in the, in the body control module too, like battery monitoring system reset, TPMS training mode with or without scanner, uh, let's see, key, keypad code reset, bunch of different things we may need to do after a maintenance type function, especially like the TPMS in the battery. All right, let's pick my next one. It's gonna be this BMW. So on this BMW doing maintenance, uh, this one's under engine, right? So under special functions on the engine, there's things like battery replacement. Once again, if I replace the battery, I need to do that. Uh, injector coating, if I replace the injectors, that's really not maintenance, but uh, reset adaptation value. Sometimes you need to do that. Starter exchange. Uh, this one I thought was kind of neat too. Vanos timing chain test. So if I suspect that I have some play in my timing chain, uh, and I need to see whether or not it's 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 good or it needs to be replaced instead of having to take it apart and examine it. I can just do this test. It's an automated test and it runs through and then it tells you whether or not it needs to be done. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But the one I want to talk about here is going to be the cooling system ventilation. So there's some vehicles uh, need to, uh, once you do the coolant, you have to burp it. You have to get get the air out, right? So just continue service function, uh, venting of cooling system. From the following system, specify order to start the bleeding procedure for the engine cooling system. The bleeding procedure takes about 12 minutes. Therefore, make sure that uh, you have a battery charger connected. So it's going to just run the pump and the pump will run up, run down, and it will just go to different, uh, different settings just to get the air out of the system. So we continue, switch on the ignition, switch on the low beams to prevent the vehicle from going to sleep. Uh, set both temperature selectors to maximum, so that way we can open up the heater core too. Press the auto button on air conditioning, blow our output to a minimum. Fully depress the accelerator for 10 seconds and do not start the engine. And then it'll start after five seconds. Okay, so it's going to go through and then you're going to be able to watch the pump speed go up and down, etc. But you need to do this in order to make sure the air gets out of the system. I suppose you might be able to vacuum fill it too, but there's an automated test to do it. so. 12 minutes later, I will have a burped cooling system. So anytime you do coolant refill, drain and flush, what have you. Uh, and then I'm going to manually terminate this because 
I don't want to do wait 12 minutes. And let's see, Volkswagen Jetta. So this one, when we're talking maintenance, it's an 18 Jetta. And on this, we go into where is it? Uh, 17. Oh, there it is down there. Instrument cluster. So if we go into the cluster on this, uh, there's service reset functions in here. And there's a lot of different things you can change. Remember how I said, maybe we want to change the oil change interval or something like that. There is, well, reset oil change, change oil interval, reset maintenance interval, uh, view existing service reset values, maximum days to next oil service, maximum mileage to next oil service, minimum mileage, oil quality, extend service interval coding, all sorts of different things that we can do in there. Now this used to be, a lot of this used to be under the Volkswagen expert mode, but it's been moved over to the VIN specific mode just because that, that way you don't have to look for it. You don't have to uh, know as much where to find it. You just put it in underneath the cluster. So that allows me to extend the oil change interval, change it 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, whatever, uh, reset that sort of thing. And speaking of expert mode, one more thing. So if I go into say BMW, there's a BMW expert mode in here too. Now it's not the same as Volkswagen expert mode. Volkswagen expert mode is pretty much just the factory tool and you can do most of the functions there. In this case, this is uh, some things that we can do in here. A lot of it has to do with um, the, uh, the maintenance, right? So uh, different specs on the vehicle and such. So in this case, we'll go into the ignition cluster two. That one. All right. So uh, let's see. Condition based service. So on some of these BMWs, they have what called con condition based service. It's going to be based on how I drive the car. It may tell me I need to change the oil earlier, uh, something like that. So it's under different conditions. So you can change the different uh, inspection intervals, uh, warning lamp delay, spark plug change intervals. Uh, whether or not it's even going to ask for it to be changed. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of different things in here. Front brake pads, rear brake pads, diesel, DPF, it has one. Uh, micro filters, so the uh, cabin filter, et cetera. So it can tell us all of these things, and you can change it in that expert mode as well. So you can say, okay, 48 months, well, I want to go out to uh, 12 months, or whatever it happens to be. You just go in here, hit edit. Go and change it from 48, go to 12. So program, there you go. And then you hit program and it'll change it. And it's done, right? So there's certain things that you may be able to do with certain vehicles, it just kind of depends on the manufacturer. Sometimes you don't even need a scan tool. Sometimes you just go in and you just hit, hit the little knob on the dash and it, it does everything you need. But oftentimes you do have to go in under with a scan tool to do a lot of those different maintenance functions too. With that, let's talk about next week. So next week is going to be after the repair, resets and relearns. So we talked a little bit about uh, you know, different programming, coding, resets, things like that today. So we'll just expand upon some of those next week. So we have coding, which we already did a class on. We have reflashing, which we've done a class on too. And then we have resets and relearns. A lot of them kind of get intermingled uh, between different things. So, um, you know, with the, uh, we'll talk resets, relearn, same time, same place, six and nine Eastern, go to snapon.com slash OT if you want to join me on Zoom. Otherwise, you can join me on YouTube at six Eastern, youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics. If you are watching, make sure you like and subscribe to the video. Uh, and then 9 p.m. Eastern goes to my Facebook page. So it's facebook.com slash snapon Jason, all one word, and that will get you there. Uh, if you want to see any of the other topics in this series, we've got 67 different episodes available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so once again, youtube.com slash staff on diagnostics. Make sure that it's a it's a uh, playlist for live training. You know, get the questions in a minute. Uh, if you did join late on Zoom and you need to ask a question, uh, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen, wherever you, you, you'll see a Q&A button, and you should be able to type it there. Uh, YouTube, of course, use the live chat. I do want to mention my buddy Keith, who also does free training for uh, for us. So he does uh, skin tool training. 
like uh, on the specific scan tool. So Wednesday is on Zeus and Thursday is a combo Apollo and Triton class. So about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes long. And then in the first hour is going to be set up functions. Let's make sure your Wi-Fi works. Let's make sure you get set up on Snap on Cloud, set up a security link. And then uh, it'll go code to completion on the scanner side of things and uh, just talk through that. Uh, and then he takes about a five minute break and then he goes in through um, he goes through uh, the scan, the scope functions. Right? So kind of component test, scope, multimeter, that sort of thing. Uh, go to snapon.com slash OT. It is Zoom only. So just check it out on there and you can just sit in front of your tool, follow along with what he's doing on his screen and you can you know go through that. All right, let's get to questions. Looks like we're clear on Zoom for the moment. Let's go to YouTube. Quinn, welcome as always. Thanks for attending. Nick from England. I know it's really late, but thanks every single every single week. Uh, you're here without fail. Donald Hopkins, Diesels. He loves Diesels. This Diesels, let's go. I know. I didn't talk I'll, I'll, I'll at length about it. I do have a whole other class that it talks about diesel emission systems and stuff. But if you haven't seen that one, Donald, that might, uh, should be worth your watch as well. Uh, Dan Cujo says hello. Matt says hello. Let's see. Yeah, so Matt says on his personal car, which is a 2015 Outlander Sport, uh, he set the reminder to go off at 3,000 miles or six miles. So you can, uh, you can mess around with the different reminders in there too. Uh, let's see. Quinn says, with all this AI talk, have you heard anything pertaining to automotive or scan tool capabilities? Well, I can't specifically say what AI, I can't really use the words AI for it, but what fast track intelligent diagnostics kind of does is something very much like that. It's where it's, you know, it's uh, taking all this data from all these different places and breaking it down, just filtering out what you need and getting rid of all the not the noise and the nonsense. So in a way, uh, we've been doing that for a while. So it definitely helps with the scan tool. That's for sure. It also helps us with uh, you know, planning out what we're doing um, as far as scan tool functions and things like that, because we can cross reference. Okay, here's the repair orders. Here's the cars that are coming in. Here's the repairs that are being done on cars. Do we have a functional test that we need to do in order to do that repair? So that kind of helps us on the back end to try and figure out exactly uh, what is most needed so we can prioritize. So fast track intelligent diagnostics, not AI, but <laughs> uh, we've been doing that since 17. So. Uh, Nick, can't wait for next week's training. Thank you. Uh, Anthony says, great presentation without any blowing of smoke. That one. Uh, let's see. Matt says, thanks for all the classes. Learn something each and every time. Uh, let's see. Claude says, when is the scan tool and shop key getting more Audi information? Not sure. Um, maybe it's like a newer Audi. I know shop key usually runs about six months behind. They try to do like the maintenance stuff first. And then they add uh, more stuff in there. So for the scan tool, the scan tool is, you know, every six months, as usual, uh, we update that. So the guide of component tests get updated. The scan tool stuff gets updated every six months. Uh, plus, you do have extra mode in there, too, for Audi as well as Volkswagen. Um, and then as far as or Audi information on Shopkey, we get everything from Audi for that. So if it's something that's not there on Shopkey, you can always give them a call to the content department, I think is what it's called. And uh, they have it. They have, it might just not be in Shopkey like where you can find it, but they, they still have it digitally. So they can find it for you and send it to you. They can email it to you. And that's for any manufacturer, they do that. Uh, so uh, not sure what exactly you're looking for there, Claude, but hopefully that Gives you a little help in uh, some of that stuff. All right. With that, looks like we've cleared the big board. So I will take this time to say thank you very much. Thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to spend a little bit of time with me. Hopefully, we got a little bit more knowledge when it comes to maintenance functions in the scan tool. Hopefully, you'll see you next week for resets and relearns. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Have a nice night. Take care.